Okay, well, welcome to this meeting of the GW Coders Group. Um, this will be our last meeting for the fall 2021 semester. We'll be meeting again starting in January. I believe our first meeting um, is, we're moving to Tuesday, and it's going to be um, Tuesday, January 25th at lunchtime again. Uh, John's schedule got changed, and he's going to be teaching now on Wednesdays, so we wanted to move it by a day. Um, John, unfortunately, can't join us today. Um, he's usually my co-facilitator, co-host of these, but he's being interviewed on lithium-ion battery technologies, which is his area of research, and he couldn't move the interview. Um, so he wishes everyone happy holidays and looks forward to putting together another series of good coding related topics for the spring. So today we have Dulce from GW Libraries presenting. And he's gonna be talking to us about PyTorch. Um, but we also wanna take a moment to thank Laura who's here um, for being a partner for GW Coder since the very beginning. She's gonna be leaving GW and going to Stanford. So. We're excited for her and her new opportunities, um, but we greatly appreciate the support she's provided since the very beginning when we first had the idea. Uh, so thank you very much, Laura, and thanks for all your service. You've been a great partner for many of us around the university. Thanks so much, Ryan. That's really kind of you. Um, and and I let John know that I was leaving, and uh, he said I could still maybe drop in from time to time if I wanted to, if that's okay with you all. <laughs> Oh, it's more than okay. Um, we debated whether to call it GW Coders because we actually wanted a broader community. Um, we've invited students and faculty from Howard on several occasions to join, um, but it just seemed to make sense to call it GW Coders since it's primarily here. But, uh, but yeah, anyone is always welcome. Um, and if you want to present anything, that's even better because I'm always trying to fill out the schedule of interesting things that can be presented. So not to steal too much of your time, Dulcie, um, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you and let you take it away. Thank you, Ryan. Um, nice to see everybody. Uh, so uh, as Ryan mentioned, um, I work in GW Libraries. Um, I'm on the same team as Laura, so we've worked on a lot of software projects together. Um, and uh, this, this talk or show and tell today um, and it's super informal, so please feel free to interrupt me with questions or whatever um, comments, uh, ways of doing things better than than I uh, will show you how to do them. Um, but th this this little talk today is about uh, Apache Spark and PySpark, um, which is one tool for working with uh, big data. Um, I put that term in quotes because it's a very loose term and. Uh, can mean lots of different things. So just to um, sort of scope the discussion today or set your expectations, uh, what I'm going to talk about today specifically focused on is focused on data sets that might be um, small enough that you can fit them on your local machine, your laptop, but too big to work within memory. So big data can obviously mean lots of other things too, like data sets that are too big to fit on a single machine. Um, and Spark is useful for those use cases too. Um, in fact, one of the things that can be a little daunting about Spark, um, and I'll, I'll def sort of give you a little uh, overview of the architecture in a second, but just to clear some caveats out of the way, one of the things that can be daunting about Spark, I found is that a lot of the documentation out there is about how to use it in more enterprise situations where you've got lots of um, different machines kind of linked together to do really big data processing jobs. Um, I was kind of pleasantly surprised to learn that it's with a little effort, um, it is also quite easy to use um, uh, on your own on a single laptop or a single computer um, and can do some pretty uh, powerful stuff and can make it possible to work with data sets that otherwise would be difficult to work with, um, at least for me using the tools at my disposal, which is primarily Python. Um, so uh, I'm gonna kind of walk through some sample code here um, as a way of introducing um, 
Spark and PySpark. Um, so you should all be able to see my notebook. Please let me know if you can't. So I'll be using a Jupyter notebook to do this in Python. Um, Spark is not a Python uh, specific tool. Um, it's actually, um, I guess the proper term for it is it's a uh, data analysis engine. Um, so it, it is actually written in the programming language Scala um, and it runs on the Java virtual machine. Um, but it has these sort of interfaces to Python and also to the R language. Um, so PySpark specifically refers to the Python library that lets you interact with Spark. Um, so when you work with PySpark, the computation is actually being done by this, this Spark uh, engine that is running basically uh, as Java uh, bytecode on your computer. Um, but you don't have to write any Java or any Scala to do that. You can write Python um, or you can actually write SQL, as, as I'll show you. Um, so uh, this is kind of this, this specs for my local setup, just to give you a sense of, of what I'm working with. Um, so I'm using a, you know, a recent version of Python. Uh, this is not, you know, this is one of the more recent versions of Spark. Um, you know, I've got the job, you, you do need Java. Um, and I've, I'll share a sort of complete version of this notebook. Um, I'll give a link, I'll put a link in the chat a little later. Um, and I've included at the end some resources for um, installing Spark or in PySpark. That's kind of, I found, uh, well, I should sort of preface this. I'm really used to working with data um, with pandas in Python. Um, I use that a lot. So the concepts um, in Spark for working with data are very similar to what you would have encountered if you've used pandas, if you've used R data frames in R, um, if you've used SQL to query databases. So it's all part of that kind of same, that universe. Um, so having a background in that, I found the most difficult part of using Spark was actually getting it up and running on my computer. So I will, I will if, offer that caveat that it is a little more challenging than just like installing a Python library. Um, it does require, as I mentioned, you to have an installation of Java um, and the way that, you know, if you've used Java or Java applications before, um, sometimes you have to be a little more attentive to how things are actually you know where files live in your computer and where things get installed than you do say with python um, or python packages which tends to take care of a little more of that for you um, so but there are some good instructions uh, out there on the web um, for installing uh, spark including its dependencies on a on a mac or a pc um, and so th this is you know kind of my environment here um, I've got 16 gigabytes, oops, sorry, uh, 16 gigs of memory on this Mac. And the data set I'm working with, uh, as an example, is actually 26 gigs. So not, not huge, um, but, but too big to um, actually load into a Pandas data frame uh, because it won't fit into my memory. Um, and it, that translates to about 1,000 files. Um, and so what is this data set just to kind of um, round out the background here? Um, this is just a bunch of tweets. Uh, I got them from our tweet sets application, which if um, I'll just put this in the chat. Uh, if this is um, open to anybody um, on the GW uh, IP network um, or off campus, if you can use the GW VPN, um, it's, part of our uh, project for collecting um, social media data. So tweet sets um, at this point is up to about a billion, a billion and a half tweets total um, organized into various collections. Um, and the collection I'm working today is a subset of our coronavirus collection, uh, which is uh, at this count, at this point, um, 350 million tweets. So that's about, that whole collection is about a terabyte um, on disk. I'm not using the full terabyte. Um, I'm just using a, a relatively small subset of it. Um, but these are these are all uh, gzipped files in in what's called JSON L format. So 
if you're familiar with JSON, this is just each line of the file as a JSON document. Um, that's JavaScript object notation, if you're not familiar with that. And that's basically the format that the Twitter API returns. So these are tweets harvested from the Twitter API um, that all, you know, have, I think the, the filter is like something, you know, any tweet with the text coronavirus or COVID or like one of those hashtags um, collected over about, uh, I think since the start of the, I think we started collecting at the start of the pandemic. So um, really interesting data set. Um, and a good example of the kind of thing that, you know, if you wanted to analyze this um, and you didn't already have kind of access to, um, you know, a computing cluster or something like that, uh, you might have some difficulty doing so on your local machine. And, and that's where something like Spark can help out. Um, so uh, just to, I'll, I'll gloss over this for now. Um, there are, th this is just some more settings that I had to, um, this is related to the Spark and Java installation. So I mentioned you kind of having to tweak some of your computer's settings. So these are some variables um, on a Mac. This would go in the bash profile um, to make, make sure your computer can find the Java virtual machine and that it knows where Spark is installed. Um, I'm not going to go through installing Spark uh, because that would kind of be a, an hour end of itself potentially. Um, but if you know, if you have questions, if you want to do this on your own and you have questions, I'm happy to try to help you as far as I can. Um, I'm certainly no expert on on uh, the installation piece, but um, I'm happy to help you try to muddle through. Um, so, but this computer already has Spark and PySpark installed. Um, so, moving into kind of what you know the the meat of this, like what why would we use Spark? Um, as opposed to some other tool. Um, so for imagining for a moment, I have these, I didn't have access to Spark and I wanted to work with this, these 26 gigabytes of JSON documents, JSON L documents. Um, this would be kind of, this code here is kind of like a naive, so to speak, approach in Python. Basically we, you know, would write a function that could loop over a list of files, um, open each file, loop over the lines in the file, and in this case, just increment a counter. So all this function does would is to count the number of tweets total in this collection. Um, and I'm just going to get, I'm not going to run this because um, I'm not going to run the actual function uh, because it, I did run it as a test and it took 11 minutes to process these thousand top files. So like that's, that's not um, super ideal, right? I mean, it does come back with an accurate result. So it tells me that in that collection, um, I've got uh, 26 million tweets. Um, but if you can imagine wanting to actually do some analysis on these tweets as opposed to just count them, right? Um, especially kind of like an iterative analysis where, you know, like I don't really know what's in this data set. So I want to try out some different kinds of ways of counting this or um, aggregating the data, um, you know, I would have to run this kind of function, modify it, run it, modify it, run it. That would be very slow. And also it would get very complicated um, if I wanted to do something like aggregate over the, the tweets, you know. Um, for instance, I might want to do something like this, right? This table um, is showing you know, the, the, the top most retweeted tweets in the data set. So to do that, I have to like aggregate over the, the text of the tweets and then, you know, take the maximum retweet. The, this retweet count is a field in the, in the Twitter um, documents you get back from the API, tells you how many times a particular tweet has been retweeted. Um, you know, so I'd have to basically group by the tweet text and then do this aggregation on it um, and do that across multiple different files um, since I can't load them all into memory, right? So that that gets kind of complicated and, um, you know, would be somewhat of a challenge to code. Um, and, you know, again, something like pandas, which will do this so beautifully if you have a data set that fits into memory, um, 
I, it, it's possible I could, you know, glue together a bunch of pandas data frames to get the answer, but I'd also kind of don't want to think about what would be involved to do that. Um, pandas really shines again on a on a data set that is smaller than your available RAM and on the data set that's bigger than your available RAM, it's really not, you know, it doesn't have a lot of um, features to help you with that. So that's where Spark in this case comes in. Um, so let me kind of, I'm going to do some code, I'm going to write some code and run it here um, to show you, kind of walk you through um, sort of basics of, of using Spark to work with this data set. Um, and again, please interrupt me as you have questions. Um, the first thing I'm doing here is using this little library called Find Spark. Um, all Find Spark does is actually what it what its name suggests. It finds where this where Spark is installed on your computer because remember Spark is not a Python library. It's a sort of totally separate application. Um, and so Find Spark kind of like has some logic to look in the right places, and um, it's particularly useful when you're using a Jupyter notebook um, to to connect your Jupyter notebook. Uh, to connect the Python kernel that's running your Jupyter Notebook to this um, installation of Spark. So once we've sort of found it, then we can import from PySpark um, a few things that we will, a few um, classes we'll need to actually um, send commands to the Spark engine. So PySpark, um, again, is already installed as a Python library that provides the actual interface. Um, PySpark SQL is, is this sort of API for Spark um, that's available in version two and above. So it's not available in Spark version one. Um, and it's the thing that provides this very um, data frame centric approach to using Spark. Um, so again, if you if you haven't used pandas in Python or if you haven't used our data frames, I apologize. That's really kind of my frame of reference here. Um, basically, it's a data table kind of structure um, modeled on a SQL database. Uh, oops, typo there. So once I've imported that. Then I can actually, the first thing I need to do is actually create what's called a Spark session. And this is, um, and again, all this code is in is in a notebook I can share. So you don't have to like take notes or anything. But when it it's when you run this line that if if Spark is not installed correctly or if your Python installation is, your Python kernel is having trouble connecting to Spark, you would usually get an error to that effect here when you try to actually create this Spark session. Once you've created the Spark session, um, you've, you've got sort of, you know, a, a live connection to Spark that will persist as long as this um, particular kernel, this Python kernel is running. Um, so, now we can read in some files and begin to work with them. And one, you know, as I mentioned, Spark is is designed for these situations where you're working with data that's too big to fit into memory. Um, and the way it can do that is it's optimized for parallel operation. So it it will basically take your code, automatically parallelize it, and then kind of like figure out, given the the files that you're working with on disk. Um, how best to kind of optimize those operations in parallel. Um, so, you know, this, I think my machine has like four cores, so it can run up to like, you know, and we'll see this a little later. Like you, you'll, you can get multiple um, Spark processes running at the same time in the background, which is something Python is not very good at. Um, and it also handles kind of like how to juggle the, the data up, how to partition the data among those different processes to um, read it most efficiently. That said, um, when you have a really big data set, especially if it's broken into multiple files, 
I don't recommend trying to work with the full data set right out of the gate. Um, because I mean, Spark is fast. It's much faster than Python in my experience, but it's still you know limited by the constraints of your computer. And 26 gigabytes, I mean, at least on this machine is still a lot of data. So um, one thing that I find works well is to, you know, in this case, we have a thousand files um, to work and they're and they all kind of have the same data structure, right? Like they're all tweets and Twitter data is very well defined um, kind of data set uh, or data object. So in that case, we can work with one file and it, and you know develop our analysis and pretty le pretty confidently then project that to the rest of the data set. Um, this uh, you know may not work in every case, obviously. Like it sort of really does depend on your data being fairly homogenous. Um, I should also have mentioned that that Spark works really is best for well structured data. So it's not you know if your data is totally unstructured, um, I'm not sure Spark is is really going to give you the same kind of leverage. Um, but in something that's like a CSV or JSON um, or any of these other data formats that have a high degree of structure, um, Spark is really uh, designed to take advantage of that. Um, so, and one of the ways that does that is by building a schema. So we'll see that in a second. Um, so I've got this list of files, which is, this is, these are all the files from my, my coronavirus Twitter set, um, the zipped files. So I'm just gonna read in one file here. And I'm using this read.json method that is part of this Spark session. So this is the Spark session object. And it can read in a number of different formats. So um, it can read in CSV, um, it can read in a bunch of um, more esoteric kinds of formats. Um, and it can also work with JSON. And one really nice thing about it is it, it can work with zipped or unzipped data. Um, so in this case, the .gz indicates that these JSON files are all zipped, but I don't have to worry about that. I can, I can just pass it, pass those files to this JSON method and it will take care of unzipping them too. Um, I do need to prefix it with this file. Um, kind of uh, this particular file prefix, just to tell it that I'm pointing it to my local file system. Um, Spark is built for lots of different kinds of environments. And so um, people often use it with uh, an HDFS or high density file system, which I'm not doing today. That's more the situation you might encounter like in a um, research computing facility or you know some other kind of enterprise system where uh, you've got lots of different servers um, that share access to the same file system. Um, but for local, your local file system is just going to be file. And so this, what this is doing, um, read.json and then that particular file is actually going to kind of build a schema for this, for the JSON documents in, uh, in those file, in that file. Um, and what do I mean by schema? We can actually see it if we do sample. And like, this is really ugly. So I can do sample.print schema and you can see a, a better representation of it. So um, I mentioned that Spark is built with Scala, which is a different programming language from Python. Scala is a highly, is a statically typed language, meaning that every data element in a Scala program has to have a specific data type associated with it. Um, in Python, your, your, your data elements are typed as well, but as a programmer, you don't really worry about that because you kind of rely on the Python interpreter to like figure it out at runtime. Scala is a compiled language, meaning that type information has to be more explicit. So you can see here, the schema is basically on the left side of the colon is the name of the field from the Twitter data from a Twitter document. And on the right side is the particular Scala type that it has assigned to that um, field. 
So every field gets a type. Um, and you can see that this, the indentation shows the nesting of this schema. So this JSON can be you know, arbitrarily nested. So you can have you know, collections of things that contain subcollections that contain subcollections. Like it can get really deeply nested. And in fact, the Twitter, Twitter's um, document model is pretty deeply nested. Uh, so Spark has, has um, kind of like deduced this schema from the file that I gave it and, you know, preserved all of the kind of nesting and also automatically de decided what type, what data type each field should be. Um, in actually doing analysis, the data types are probably less, um, you know, it, that may be a little less important to you, but the nest, the, the nested structure is actually really valuable. Um, and this is something that like say a pandas data frame um, can't do, right? So, so Python pandas, um, and it might, this might also be true of data frames in R, but I, I don't know that for a fact, um, are really designed for like flat data. So something that would be like a table, like a CSV. When it comes to data that's nested more deeply than that, they, they don't have a whole lot of, or at least pandas doesn't have a whole lot of tools built in to handle that. Um, Spark, on the other hand, can handle arbitrarily nested data. So this is like, this is really cool um, if you are used to working with Twitter uh, JSON documents, because there's a lot of information in here that's like really kind of buried um, in underneath some of these layers. And with Spark, you can actually get to it pretty easily, um, which we can we can see in a little bit. Um, so I can actually get a reference to this schema, which will come in handy later. Um, but one thing I'll just point out that one of the reasons for, for working with a small sample um, is not only you know, efficiency in developing your initial computations, but also to get the schema from it. So again, I'm pretty confident with Twitter data, assuming that in one, any one given batch of uh, Twitter documents, at least within the same kind of collection, that's you know been data that's been collected with the same kind of parameters, that the documents in that batch will have the same schema as documents in other batches from that collection. So you know you notice that Spark took a few seconds to get to read this in, and that was mostly devoted to its sort of figuring out what the schema is. So because I have now done that, I can reuse this schema when working with the full data set. Um, and that actually saves a lot of time because if you do, if you, if you run this on your full data set, you know, in this case of 26 gigabytes, it's not, you know, it, it's gonna need some time to figure out that schema because it's actually got to run through all 26 gigabytes, look at every file, look at all the JSON documents in all those files and on the basis of that, come up with what it thinks the schema should be, as opposed to what we're doing, which is just asking it to look at a single file, which you know has however many tweets in it, figure out a schema and then apply that schema to all the rest. Um, so this is a valuable um, method for working with big data in Spark. So now that we've got the schema and we've got their doc, our um, sample read in, we can start to actually do some, some computation. So I'm gonna start with a super simple method, just count. So, and I can run this on, um, well, I, I should say first, what is sample at this point as the outcome of this read.json method? It's, it's what's called a Spark data frame. Um, so I can run the count method on a full data frame and it will just return how many rows are in that data frame. Um, so in this case, there's 73,000 tweets in this first sample. Now let's, we can get a little more um, complicated with the syntax. So let's say that we wanted to find out how many unique tweets were in there. So again, this requires you know, knowledge of your, your 
data set domain. But in this case, um, I know that there's this field called ID string in the tweets that has the, uh, that's a unique identifier that every tweet gets. So I'm using this select method, um, which can be used to select a, a single column or multiple, well, a single field or multiple fields from um, a Spark data frame, the same way that in SQL, you can select a column or multiple columns from a table. So um, Pandas uh, for Python users doesn't have a select statement the same way. So this is one example where while the Pandas syntax and the Spark sy PySpark syntax are pretty close in some respects, um, they do diverge to the extent that uh, Spark syntax is based much more closely on actual SQL syntax, standard SQL syntax than Pandas. Um, so you'll see some things here that, you know, if you've ever done written SQL queries will seem um, pretty familiar. And I think that's intentionally so. Um, so um, from the point of view of the designers of Spark. So I can select this column and then I can run this distinct method to get just the unique values in it. Um, and then I can run the count method on those to get the, the count of distinct ID string uh, values. And you can see in, in Spark or in PySpark, it's quite common to kind of chain together um, things with the dot um, notation here. And then there's 73,809. So a little, a little less than the actual total number of tweets. Um, this might seem, you know, at this point, this may actually be running a little slower than if you were to do this on my computer with, with just pandas in Python. Um, because again, it's not necessarily got this whole data set in memory. Now, this is a pretty small data set, so it could very well, it could very well put it in memory. Um, but it, it doesn't necessarily. So you won't necessarily see with a really small data set or a relatively small data set, you won't necessarily see much efficiency in using Spark over some other tool. But once we get to all 26 gigabytes, this will actually scale pretty well. So in other words, if, if these operations seem a little slow right now, when we're running it on the full like 26 million tweets, they will actually be much faster compared to a lot of other methods that you might use. So I'll just um, work through a, a few other queries just to show kind of um, the range of operations that's available. And again, please, please interrupt if you have questions. So in addition to select, you can do a where statement to filter. Um, and one uh, difference here from a SQL query is in SQL, you almost always do your select statement first and then your where statement. And with, with Spark or with this Spark syntax, um, it's actually reversed. So I'm filtering first. So I'm saying where, um, and I wanna focus on this retweeted, comp, re retweeted status field. So I wanna count how many um, tweets in this, uh, collection are retweets. So I can use this F. So F is this um, particular uh, class that we imported up here, the PySpark SQL functions. And it's got a lot of specific functions for working with um, different aspects of the uh, Spark data frame. This COL uh, f.col is just a way to reference, reference a particular column when you want to do an operation on that column. And there's, there's uh, a few different ways to do all of this. So this is not necessarily like the, this is not necessarily the best syntax. Um, it's just the one that I happen to be familiar with. But if you look at the documentation for PySpark, often they'll give you, you know, multiple ways to do the same thing. Um, but so what I'm saying here is where this retweeted status field or column is not null, 
right? So I'm limiting the data set just to those documents where the retweeted status is not null, meaning that that field exists. Now that field is actually a complex field, meaning it's nested, but right now I don't, for this query, I don't care about that. I'm just going to take that data set. So this filtered data set, and then I'm going to select on that. So you see how I can sort of chain this, chain things together here. Um, I could also, and let me do it this way actually, just to show you something else. So I can write this. And that seemed to run really fast. And the reason was it actually hasn't executed yet. So this is this is an important um, point to keep in mind about Spark 2. Um, it, it, it does what's called, it is, it's what's called lazily evaluated, meaning that it's not actually going to execute any query against your data until it sort of gets to the point where you actually ask it to show you a result or to like write the result to disk. So at this point, I've constructed part of a query, but you know I haven't executed it because I haven't asked it to like give me back the results. This is also a little different from like a pandas data frame, uh, which every time you run an expression with pandas, it's basically executing it. Um, but in this case, because the data is on disk and it's not necessarily you know in memory and easily available, it does this lazy evaluation thing. So I, I can take this filtered version now and I can select on that and I can do, I'm just gonna do a different, a different version of that count distinct query. So this is doing the same thing as this, but instead of saying select ID string dot distinct dot count, I'm saying select, and then I'm applying the function count distinct directly to the column. This is a little more SQL-esque, if you will. It's like writing a SQL query where you would write select count distinct ID string. Now, if I do that, it's just going to give me this, which is, you know, it's no data. It's just actually showing me kind of like a placeholder. Like this is what your result would look like. It would be a data frame with one column, which is the distinct count distinct ID strings um, from this uh, from this filtered version that I'm, I'm running it against. To actually see the data, I need to do this show command. And when I append show to something, it will actually execute. And show just means execute the query and present the results like in the data frame format on the screen. So instead of show, you can do a bunch of other stuff. You can also write to CSV. Um, you can write to many different formats. Um, but show is handy for kind of like looking at your results on the fly. So it's not as pretty as a pandas data frame because it's kind of got this like old school, like ASCII styling here. Um, but this is this is the result for that operation. So there's 60,900 tweets that are retweets in this collection. Um, let me, I'm going to skip, we only have 15 minutes left. So let me, I'm going to skip a little over what every, I'm not going to cover everything I wanted to show you, but, um, you, again, you can look at the complete notebook and I will go ahead and put the link to that in the chat right now. So in case anybody has to leave early, you still have that if you want. So um, I'm, I want to show you the explode function because that's that's I think pretty cool. So if you um, remember from our schema that I said there was a lot of nesting. So one of the nesting one of the nested elements is actually the hashtags from the tweets. So root is like the document top level. So you can see entities is like a field on the root, meaning it's a top level field. And under entities, it's got this hashtags field. And hashtags is actually an array, meaning that in, in Spark terms, it's an array, meaning it it's like a list of things, um, 
right? So hashtags will be a list and each element of this array of hashtags will have two fields. So the text, which is the hashtag, and then the indices, which are like the, I'm not actually really sure what they refer to, maybe like the position in the tweet where the hashtag appears. Um, so what that would look like in practice, um, yikes, that's long, uh, would be something like this, you know, so it would be entities and then under entities, you would have another struct or, you know, in Python terms, a dictionary. And then that itself would be like, um, a list if we're talking Python or an array in, in Scala. And that list would contain uh, further objects, which Scala is going to call a struct. So this is like an abbreviated version of what the Twitter data looks like, right? But we've got, we have this entities field and then within that, this hashtags, uh, oh, sorry, more, yeah, within that, this hashtags object and then within that, this text field that actually has the hashtag. So that's like, that. that's not um, using kind of like normal parsing of JSON, that, that could be a little bit of a headache to get to. Um, and then what we well, let's say what we actually want to do is um, like get a list of all these hashtags um, so that we can like find out which hashtags are most popular. So what if I just do this? If I just select the outer field entities dot hashtags. So you can see here, it's it's returning this, you know, we saw that it contained a list of inner, you know, and then there's this inner object with the, the text. So, you know, it can, it can retrieve that, but this isn't very useful. And this is kind of like where you would get to in pandas, if you were working with this JSON document and like a pandas data frame, like you'd end up with some columns that had some like Python objects, complex Python objects in them and, then you'd have to start writing some um, of your own functions to go in there and extract things. And at that point, pandas would cease to be super efficient because you'd be write, writing too much of your own Python code. Um, so one of the things I really like about Spark is it, it gives you tools for working with this situation. So one thing I can do is run this explode function on that column. And we'll explode, we'll do, it may not be immediately evident, but explode takes an array and creates a new row for each element in the array. So, and you can see that if I add in the ID of the actual tweet. So my select statement now has is referring to two columns. One is being made up out of this explode function on the entities.hashtags field, and the other is just the ID string field. So when I run that, here you can see on the right, this ID string is repeated, meaning that for this first, for this first tweet ending in 11264, there is three hashtags. The first one, you know, something about Putin, then China, then something about coronavirus. Now we've we've still got this like other data inside the hashtag object that we don't really necessarily care about like these these um, indices. So we can also get rid of that. Um, but but this explode function is really useful anytime your your nested data has arrays in it, like the Twitter the Twitter data does. Um, so just to show you kind of how we can, um, I'll just kind of finish out this query. Uh, so let's say we want to get we want to get the um, 
the actual hashtag text out of that object now that we've exploded. So sometimes this is a little easier to see what you're working with. If instead of show, you use take, and take takes a number as the argument, and take will actually give you, instead of giving you a data frame, it gives you this other Spark structure. Um, I believe uh, the name of it is escaping me at the moment, but it's it's usually kind of like less useful for analysis, but it's better for actually seeing kind of like how the how how a particular row of your Spark data frame is put together, because this is actually showing you the different um, elements that are in this row. So this is one row. It's got this row class. Um, within it, it's got this other row class that has these sort of subfields, indices, and text. And then it's got this ID string as another column. So this is one column. And it's kind of like you can think of it as a nested column. And then this is another column. So based on that, I can actually write, let's do this now. Um, so I'll, I'll assign this to a hashtags variable, and then I'll say hashtags.select. And again, I think this is just, this is pretty neat. So I can actually select this nested sub column of my, so, you know, so this basically creates a structure like this with, with a column that's, that's got a, a sort of nested underneath it, indices and text. I can select just the text part now by doing call.text. And call is just the name it happened to give this column when I exploded it. It just, you, you could, there's another function you can use called alias to rename a column when you explode it. Um, if you don't do that, it'll just name it col by default. So I can refer to that and its subcolumn with the dot notation. So I can say select ID string and then call dot text and then show. And now it pulls out the text. We can confirm it's the same data because we've got this first tweet 11264 appearing three times just as though we did up here. But then instead of seeing all this extra stuff, we're just seeing the hashtags. So, and now at this point, we could build on that and use this to like group on the hashtags and do some aggregation. Um, so that was gonna be the next thing I showed you. We only have like five minutes, so I'll probably just leave that time for questions. Um, but I'll, if, you, if you're interested, uh, the rest of the notebook, um, I mean, this isn't a terribly complex example, but it just walks through how to do some aggregations on the Twitter data um, and uh, how to run these queries on the full data set um, once you've kind of finalized your, once you've kind of fine tuned your queries on the sample, how to then just run it on the full data set. Um, Spark has some nice built in monitoring tools that can help you uh when you're running it on something of you know like 26 gigabytes or bigger that can take a few minutes um it's got an interface you can kind of watch the progress of the spark engine and it'll actually you know if you get really interested in working with spark and work on even bigger data sets and in environments where you really need to be optimized um, it gives you lots of tools for optimizing things um i've only kind of scratched the surface there but um it's it's a quite quite a powerful tool. Um, we actually use it in our tweet sets application that I mentioned at the beginning um, in that more kind of enterprise situation. So uh, we have we have a few different connected uh, virtual machines that run run a, run Spark jobs in a cluster um, to to process the tweets when we ingest them, um, and that's ended up making our application a lot more efficient than it would be otherwise. Um, so it's great for stuff like that, but it also is is pretty good just for um, kind of like one-off analysis if you have to be working with a data set that's too big to fit into memory. 
So let me um, stop there and see if anybody has any questions or comments or any, any other announcements or anything. Thanks so much, this is great. Is Spark um, case sensitive or case insensitive? Um, which, what do you mean in terms of the column names or? Yeah, or, or actually like in terms of like, you've now got results returned and you wanted to group, do you have to group or flatten first into like all the same type of case? Uh, yeah, if you wanted to group on, on, um, on say hashtag, you, you would probably need to do that. Um, it, it has some uh, function, lots of string functions you can use. Um, and in fact, one of the things that I was, you can see in the notebook um, uh, that I shared, you can write, this is what I did was writing, write, wrote these queries using kind of like the PySpark functions. You can write the same queries in your in Python, you know, in your Python environment, as SQL queries using pretty standard SQL syntax, and have Spark execute that SQL um, and do the same thing. And I've found that for more complex queries, it actually is a little. I find it because I've had you know some practice with SQL in the past. Um, I find it a little more efficient to do that because you can write just like kind of like one block of SQL quote code that you know does all these different transformations um, as opposed to stringing together a bunch of individual Python functions like this. Um, but the uh, the Spark uh, functions are documented uh, pretty well, um, and you know pretty much anything you can do like in a SQL database. Uh, the same sorts of functions are available in Spark, along with some additional ones that make working with this nested data more, um, make that easier. Um, the one thing that, you know, you will, you will encounter when looking through documentation about Spark or reading about people's use cases, the one caveat to keep in mind is it's important to as much as you can rely on the predefined Spark functions. And you can compose these in pretty complex ways. Like our, our tweet sets um, ingest process, the SQL, the query for that is like pretty complicated because we're dealing with a whole bunch of different fields and we need to like unpack some of these arrays and transform them in different ways. And I was able to get all that working with just the Spark functions. You can also have Spark run functions that like you define yourself in Python, but the caveat there is that those will be much slower because when you're just using Spark functions, basically, you know, all of this, because these are all Spark functions, all of this is just telling the Spark engine, okay, here's what I want the query to do. And then it has this whole like query optimizer that will come up with the right query and all of that will then be compiled into, you know, translated into Scala code and then compiled into Java bytecode and then run on the Java virtual machine. So, you know, that, that's pretty fast. If you write your custom Python function and tell Spark to run it, it's gonna have to kind of like work with the Python interpreter. So it's not gonna be able to parallelize as efficiently. Um, so there, I think there are cases, you know, that where the built the native scale of functions, the Spark functions don't don't do what you need, and sometimes it's unavoidable to do something like um, write your own Python function. But but people do warn against doing that if you can. And just to get an idea of the time differences, so earlier you showed that uh, if you were to run the query against the twenty six gigs. It was going to take 11 minutes just to count the numbers. Yeah. Once you, so if you take that file and expand it to, instead of just the sample file, but do the full data set file, what would be the similar for Spark to do that same count? Um, I think it, I didn't record just for the count. I think it does it in like a couple minutes. Um, I had some queries. Uh, 
like um, doing this query. Well, I didn't finish out the query, but like grouping by hashtag. Did I do that one? Um, I'm not sure I did that one full data set. Uh, but I, I did do some like grouping and aggregating across the full data set on, on a few different um, fields, which you can see in the notebook. Um, and everything was generally under 10 minutes. Um, so like, you know, if you're working with like a terabyte of data, it's still going to take some time. Um, yeah. But it, it is, you know, in my experience, much faster than trying to do it uh with just python code um and 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 the other advantage is that it it you know you don't have to kind of reinvent the wheel like it it i i wouldn't know off the top of my head how to do a group by aggregation for data that doesn't fit into memory just using python right like you'd have to figure out okay like how do i handle these all these intermediate steps right of like I look at a file, I figure out what the groups are. I'm gonna look at another file. I have to update my groups. Like working with stuff where you have to work with multiple files and you can't load them all into one big blob in memory um, really increases the complexity of your code. And so one of the advantages of Spark apart from the speed is that it, it hides a lot of that complexity from you and gives you an interface where you can basically act as though um, your data was all in memory um, or act as though you had it all in a SQL database. I, I guess I should say that would be kind of like the, I guess the pre-Spark version of working with, you know, a, a pre-Spark approach to working with 26 gigabytes of data would be to like ingest it into an SQL database and query the database. But, you know, then you'd have to figure out like how to, what your database schema is and all that. Whereas Spark also does that part for you too, which is, um, makes life much easier. Oh, John joined us, by the way. <laughs> so I, I missed a lot of the early stuff, but I've been playing a lot with um, Apache Arrow, mm. um, which is like, uh, well, for R. And it has a lot of similar functionality in terms of it being a solution for dealing with lots of disaggregated data files that, you know, sum together to one giant data set. And I've been dealing with uh, a data set on vehicle listings that is 128 gigabytes on disk. And it's something like 900 million rows and I think like 40 columns. I mean, it's just massive. And yet, like these kinds of operations are blazingly fast like doing uh doing counts and stuff like that it can just do it in like under a minute mm -hmm. i mean i'm just plugging it in from a hard drive in yeah. my empty laptop and it can it can blow through it so i i really i'm going to go back and watch the watch this whole thing because i miss a lot of it but i mean this is also part of apache right i mean it's all yeah. mm -hmm. deep. this is i think what apache is doing is incredible for dealing with larger and larger data sets, especially ones that are, you know, broken up into lots of different files. It's, I, I, I was also using SQL on this for the previous year. And so I discovered that and then I said, oh, I don't need to use SQL at all anymore. I mean, I can just do it all off a little hard drive. It's, yeah. yeah, thanks for sharing that. I, I have heard, of, I haven't used Apache Arrow, but I've often heard it mentioned in similar contexts. Um, there is also a Spark interface for R. It's called Spark R. Um, not being an R user, I've never used it, but um, I imagine it would work somewhat similar to PySpark. I think maybe one of the differences is this. I think a lot of Spark is designed for data sets or data that is like not on some local hard drive. It's like it's in a cloud somewhere, right? And then you can you can pull down different, you can do queries to the cloud. I think that's my understanding is like it was designed sort of for that where everything is like disaggregated and then you can send these commands to like a cloud computer that is gonna process everything very, very fast. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. yeah. Which is different, I think, when, maybe from Arrow. 
Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Maybe I'll do one on the arrow in the screen. Uh, I'll, I'll put you down for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning a lot about it, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to hit stop on the record.